Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final and valedictory session of the uh, 16th uh, Annual Conference, Public Policy and Management, hosted by the Center for Public Policy at IIM Bangalore. I am very pleased and honored to welcome uh, Professor Jean Dres, who is going to give the valedictory address. Of course, uh, Professor Jean Dres does not need any introduction at all for uh, people in India and abroad who have been even remotely interested in following social development movements or social policy here. But as someone who is chairing and moderating this session, I feel like uh, I, I'll do my duty and uh, provide a very brief uh, introduction, introduction to Professor Jean Dres. Uh, Professor Dres has uh, studied mathematics at the University of Essex and has got his PhD from ISI Delhi. And he's taught at very many places, including uh, the London School of Economics, the Delhi School of Economics, and currently he's visiting professor at uh, Ranchi University, as well as honorary professor at the Delhi School of Economics. He's made wide ranging contributions to development economics across very many domains, too numerous, I think, to be said here, but in all the important fields that one can think of that very broadly lie under the rubric of human development, with an inclusive, uh, uh, using an inclusion uh, lens. He has co-authored several books uh, with, he's written several books, uh, mm -hmm. a couple of which have been co-authored with uh, Professor Amatya Sen. He's also co-authored the Probe Report. And his latest book is uh, Sense and Sol Solidarity, Jhola Wala Economics uh, for Everyone. I'm sure everybody is very keen to hear uh, Professor Jean Dres. Uh, Professor Dres, thank you so much for making time out of what we know is a very busy schedule. Uh, your combined role as, I think, activist and scholar and action-oriented research, uh, we know you're busy on the field. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Hema. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this wonderful conference. I have not been able to watch the proceedings so far, but I, I did look at a number of the papers that were presented. I begin with a simple question. Why do some ideas flourish while others fall into oblivion? And why are some thinkers better remembered than others? In academia, the presumption seems to be that good ideas flourish and others perish so we don't need to scout history for forgotten thinkers. And if we read the so-called classics like Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill, Mahatma Gandhi and others, then we are fine. So that is one way of looking at our selective memory of ideas and thinkers, but I think that there is more to it. Another plausible line of reasoning is that ideas that suit the privileged and powerful tend to flourish, and those that are inconvenient to them tend to be forgotten. The reason is not difficult to understand. The reason is that it is the privileged and powerful who have the resources to fund conferences, award prizes, and though university chairs organize memorial lectures, convene panel discussions, and generally promote the ideas that appeal to them. This is a fairly obvious hypothesis, and it should appeal to economists because it is based on economic reasoning, but to the best of my knowledge, it has not attracted much attention. There is one place where it is very clearly stated, and that is the Communist Manifesto, where Marx and Engels wrote that the ruling ideas of each age have ever been the ideas of the ruling class. That is an extreme form of the point I am making, and I'm not going to that extreme. I am making a more modest statement that ideas have a better chance to survive and thinkers have a better chance of being remembered if they serve powerful interests. One can give many examples to illustrate this argument. I'll just give a couple of examples very quickly. One interesting example is how Ambedkar, Dr. Ambedkar, nearly became a forgotten thinker. I am mentioning Ambedkar partly because today we have lost a great Ambedkar scholar, Gail Ambed, Dr. Gail Ambed, 
And had it not been for the work of Dr. Gaylon Vett and other scholars, including many Dalit scholars uh, who helped to revive our intellectual memory, it is possible that today, Dr. Ambedkar would be forgotten as an intellectual, not by the public, but by India's intellectual elite. In fact, of course, there has been a lot of revival of interest in Dr. Ambedkar's ideas in the last 20 years, partly under the influence of these scholars. But if you go back beyond that, around the end of the 20th century, uh, very few people uh, among the Indian intellectual elite uh, talked about or read Ambedkar. I came to India in 1979, and between that time and 2002, when I moved to Allahabad and stumbled on Ambedkar's book, The, Anni and the Annihilation of Caste, nobody told me in those 23 years that uh, Ambedkar was an important thinker or somebody that we should be reading. And even if you look, if you want a more objective indicator, if you look at, for example, the name indexes of history books that were published at that time, quite often Ambedkar was not mentioned or just mentioned in passing. So what is the reason for that? Well, could it be that Ambedkar had things to say that the ruling castes and classes of India didn't particularly want to hear? Uh, he had some very, uh, difficult things to, to say. For example, of course, he called for the annihilation of the caste system, but also argued that if we want to annihilate caste, then we may have to junk some of the Hindu scriptures. So these are not the kinds of things that would be music to the ears of the intellectual elite. Let me mention a, another example of lopsided uh, intellectual memory and lopsided ideas closer to the topic of this talk. In economics, the virtues of competition and of market competition in particular are praised to no end, but cooperation receives very little attention. In fact, you can easily do a PhD in economics without ever hearing the word cooperation. There are of course, specialized branches of economics where cooperation receives attention, such as cooperative game theory, and the literature on economic cooperatives, but most students of economics will not hear of them. So what is the reason for this? Is it that competition is somehow more important than, more important than cooperation in economic and social life? I doubt it. More likely the virtues of competition receive exaggerated attention because they appeal to people in positions of power and influence. Indeed, they are the winners in the competition. So naturally, the idea that competition is a good thing must be music to their ears. It is for similar reasons, perhaps, that self-interest is often praised in economics to the extent of being confused with rationality, when in fact, self-interest and rationality have nothing to do with each other. By the way, Dr. Vergis Curien, since we are remembering him on the occasion of his uh, uh, birth centenary, uh, apparently hated economists. According to Tushar Shah uh, in his obituary of Dr. Kurian about 10 years ago, here is what Dr. Kurian said in his keynote address to the Indian Society of Agricultural Economics in Pune in 1984. May your tribe perish. You are never there where the action is. You come after the event and glibly find fault. If I am born again, I will become an economist so that others do all the work while all I do is criticize. Hopefully things have improved since 1984. Uh, these are harsh words, but apparently Dr. Kurian got a standing ovation for them. Now, none of this is to deny that competition works wonders for some purposes, but the idea that competition is the general fountain of human progress does not stand much scrutiny. In fact, many of the best things in life build on some form of cooperation or public action more than on competition. If you want a choice between 100 different types of cars, market competition may serve you quite well. But if you want good public transport or healthcare, 
or quality education or a sound environment or a fair justice system or a functioning democracy or almost anything that really makes a big difference to the quality of life, market competition will not take you very far. In all these fields, some form of public action or cooperation is essential. And if you think of it, even when you drive a car, you depend on public authorities to ensure safety standards, pollution norms, traffic control, and the help of an ambulance if you have an accident. Now, public action is not the same thing as cooperation, but many forms of public action do have a strong cooperative element. And cooperation is the basis of many important social institutions, starting, for instance, with the family. Some of the most valuable activities in life, like bringing up children, happen within the family in a cooperative mode. Beyond the family, many other institutions build on cooperation more than competition. For instance, sports clubs, university departments for that matter, churches, trade unions, political parties, and of course, economic cooperatives. Now, in many of these institutions, of course, co competition also plays a role. For instance, when people play football in a sports club, the two teams compete with each other, but they also cooperate in observing the rules of the game. This illustrates the fact that competition and cooperation are not necessarily opposed to each other. There is, there is a time and place for both. The point I am making is that we tend to overvalue competition and underrate cooperation, at least in economics. Following on this, we need to pay more attention to the scope for fostering cooperation in economic and social life. If we are able to expand the realm of cooperation in society, it could really help to make the world a better place. Just to mention one simple example, think of what India would be if parents, teachers, and administrators cooperated to ensure the best possible education for all the country's children, or schools would be transformed. Given the wide ranging personal and social roles of elementary education, this would also change the country and people's lives. A similar point applies to the healthcare system. Now, if we want to foster cooperation in economic and social life, we need to think of what makes cooperation difficult. One major ob obstacle is inequality and conflict. That includes economic inequality and class conflict, but in India, it also includes caste conflict. The fact that caste and the caste system stand in the way of cooperation and solidarity is a point that was made clearly by Dr. Ambedkar in his book, The Annihilation of Caste, where he wrote that caste has killed the public spirit. Going back to the example of schooling, it would obviously be easier for parents and teachers to work together if they were not divided along caste lines. How are Dalit children supposed to learn in school when they are taught by an upper caste teacher, for instance, who has no particular empathy for them? That, of course, may not be the general situation, but I am not inventing a problem in the uh, schooling surveys that we have been doing from the 1990s onwards at that time for the probe report and more recently in the context of, of looking at the consequences of the closure of schools for as long as 17 months so far in India uh, during the COVID crisis. Uh, we keep finding examples of uh, uh, children who are taught by teachers uh, who don't necessarily think that it's important for these children to be educated. And that's a reflection of the traditional upper caste mentality. Very recently, in fact, in one village of uh, Latihar district in Jharkhand, we uh, came across uh, Dalit families in a village where the teacher belonged to upper caste families where some people were saying quite openly that if these children study, then who is going to work 
in our fields and in, in our homes. So in that situation, of course, it's not surprising that education is making little progress, especially for the marginalized sections of society. Now, this is not to say that solidarity and cooperation are generally lacking in India. There are also many important instances of uh, solidarity and cooperation, but very often solidarity happens within the caste or community. One example of this is block voting on caste lines. Block voting is not necessarily a bad idea because an individual voter has virtually zero weight in the counting of votes. So an individual vote makes no difference. That is why it makes sense for groups of people to vote as a block so that their votes actually matter. And in India, this takes the form of block voting on caste lines simply because caste is the traditional unit of solidarity. There's a very interesting anecdote in Sujata Gidla's book, Ants Among Elephant, which conveys uh, how solidarity typically happens within the caste in India. She tells a story of how as a child in a Dalit Christian family of Tamil Nadu, uh, the village was one day flooded after a severe storm. And so uh, many people's houses were uh, flooded or destroyed. And she notes that a lot of people were helping each other but only within the caste. She says throughout the village, families of each caste helped others from the same caste. And because she was from a Dalit family and the Dalits didn't have uh, well-built houses where they could have taken refuge, uh, they were left high and dry, not dry actually, high and wet uh, in the local school for three days without food or dry clothes without anyone helping them. The debilitating effects of the caste system on social solidarity can also be seen from the fact that casteless societies in India, and there are some, uh, tend to have a stronger tradition of cooperation. The Adivasi societies of Eastern India, for instance, have remarkable institutions of cooperation and mutual aid. Indeed, mutual aid is the method they routinely adopt, or at least used to adopt, for a wide range of activities, such as building a house, clearing the forest, transplanting rice, celebrating festivals, organizing marriages, resolving disputes, local self-government, or for that matter, public protests. We have much to learn from this rich tradition of mutual aid among Adivasis and also among other practitioners of egalitarian counterculture in India. By way of conclusion, let me just reiterate the need to expand the boundaries of cooperation in social life. In fact, this is becoming a matter of survival. We have reached a point, perhaps for the first time in history, where there's a real danger that the human race will self-destroy relatively soon, or perhaps go back to the Middle Ages. Nuclear war, climate change, genetic engineering, pandemics, and a worldwide economic crisis are just five examples of possible ways in which this could happen. Averting these dangers requires worldwide cooperation, not only on a case-by-case -case basis, but also as a matter of routine. To say that cooperation is the wave of the future may sound like wishful thinking, but failing that, there may be no, there may be no future at all. Thank you. Very interesting and provoking. As an economist myself, I can completely relate to the fact that I, I, I don't think I studied cooperation in economic models or theory or um, empirics. <laughs> Uh, except, as you said, in cooperative game theory, I think the most uh, obvious place where it was first introduced was in prisoner's dilemma as to why are they not cooperating <laughs> and coming 
to a similar and coming to a payoff that would be beneficial for both of them, right? So I think this. So so so, so I'm glad you mentioned the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, one could say quite a lot about it, but uh, but the way that the way the dilemma is read in economics typically is that there's some kind of impossibility about cooperation. That's kind of, you know, there's a free rider problem. And because there are free, free rider problem, cooperation is unlikely. And therefore it's kind of naive to expect people to cooperate. I think it's often read in that way. But the other way to read it is that it shows that if people want to cooperate, then they have to depart from this self-interest paradigm and uh, you know that is not uh, wishful thinking i mean there's a lot of all kinds of behaviors in society that are not based on self-interest they are not necessarily altruistic i mean you don't you, you don't you don't need to be an altruist to do something that departs from self-interest for example if you rush to the rescue of somebody who had an accident you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are an altruist. It certainly doesn't mean that you have any particular love for that person. You may even hate that person, but you think, you know, you do it because that's how you feel that one should behave in that situation. Right, absolutely. In fact, but people who study cooperation and I think any uh, sort of measure within this field of economics is like, you know, maybe feminist economists or ecological economists, they're typically non-mainstream or they're labeled as heterodox. Yeah. Right, so you don't get very far by claiming to be a heterodox economist. So the classical neoliberal, neoclassical is what rules. So I, I think this is a very interesting point uh, that you've brought well, up. Just my point that some ideas get a better hearing. Than right, them. it's not an accident. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. I'm yet to see a heterodox economist probably win the Nobel. There is a concept of cooperation which you sort of uh, elaborated on. But since you also invoke Korean, uh, whom we have been invoking for the last two days, is there a fundamental difference between a cooperative enterprise and cooperation in general? Because uh, in, when you look at the cooperative enterprise, it's no different from a for-profit enterprise in terms of its operative details, except that the profit distribution is somewhat uh, uh, distinct. So how do you look at a cooperative enterprise? Is that, uh, you know, as against a... Uh, the larger theory of cooperation and the capitalist form of organization. So I think there are different kinds of cooperation and cooperatives. I don't think Dr. Korean would have agreed that uh, Amul is like any other profit-making enterprise except that the profits go to the farmers. Obviously, the fact that the profits go to the farmer is important. But I think his view was that the enterprise the objective of the enterprise was not to maximize profit, but to serve the interests and the well-being of the farmers, which is not the same as just giving them the profits. So I don't think that would be necessarily correct. Um, but you know, there are many different objectives one can pursue by forming a cooperative enterprise that departs from a traditional capitalist um, profit maximizing enterprise. You can serve the interests of the members, that's one. You can try to do something that has a social purpose, that's the idea of social business. And you can also try to create a democratic workplace. So there are many things you can try to do. Uh, so I th don't think there's a single uh, notion of cooperative distinct from capitalist enterprises. I think there are many different ways of organizing enterprises and different objectives that, were, that one can pursue other than profit maximizing. And I think that's where there's a future in a range of different types of enterprises that serve different purposes and that appeal to different kinds of workers. And so hopefully over time, uh, one will be able to uh, restrict, restrain the boundaries of uh, capitalist profit making. And to some extent it is happening. I mean, in Western Europe, apparently about 10% of the workforce now works in the private non-profit sector uh, that's, a, that's separate from the public sector. So it's already, so the private non-profit sector, including all kinds of cooperatives are already a, quite a large uh, part of the economy. And I think we can go further in that direction. What do you think about the role of the newly announced Ministry of Cooperation in encouraging cooperation in India? I have not really looked into it. I've been busy with the field survey for the last few weeks. But uh, I'm kind of suspicious because it seems to be part of a general trend of centralization 
in India today, which I think is not very healthy. We are seeing that centralization in many fields, uh, including social policy. And uh, very often it's kind of counterproductive. I mean, we have seen, for example, just to speak about a couple of things that I'm actually more knowledgeable about, uh, we have seen very counterproductive centralization in the Employment Guarantee Act, which was not at all meant to be centralized. I mean, the initial idea of the act was that it would be an enabling national leg legislation, and then every state within that national framework would be free to frame its own employment guarantee scheme and uh, have its own guidelines and so on, and certainly its own payment system, et cetera. But the Employment Guarantee Act has been more and more centralized over the years. And now, you know, somebody sitting in um, Krishi Bhavan in New Delhi can overnight issue instructions that cause havoc uh, in the entire system, in particular by redesigning the, the wage payment system on the, all the time, leading to so-called teething problems that often last for years. And then there's another rejigging by that time and it has been going on now for more than 10 years. So that's one example. Uh, we are seeing centralization in the public distribution system, including the, the imposition in a very top-down manner of biometric authentication. And uh, at least here in Jharkhand, there is evidence that it has caused very serious problems and quite likely similar problems have happened elsewhere as well. So I think that we should resist that trends for, trend towards centralization. And in particular, I mean, it's completely contrary to the spirit of cooperatives that they should be um, regulated and managed from Delhi. I mean, the whole idea of cooperatives is to put power and decision-making in people's hands. So I have not looked at the details of this, but I can say that I'm suspicious because of this general trend of centralization. By the way, the other, another one is the, uh, the labor codes. I mean, the labor codes to a large extent are a repackaging of the earlier laws, but with a very strong element of centralization that gives a huge power to the central government to decide all kinds of things. So it's another example. So I think we should try to resist that trend as far as possible. I think to add on to what you've talked about in terms of centralization, I would also probably spotlight some of the farm bills, right? The changes that have happened. That's another example, absolutely. Right? The absolutely. APMCs, I mean, part of it has now become central, right? Yes. And it's so taking away the power from the states. So That's I'm right. curious, so given your sort of vast uh, field experience, uh, why aren't states resisting this kind of centralization more actively? I mean, there, is, there are some noises, right, that are to be made, but do you have any observations or do we, we see sort of pockets of resistance, but they also seem to come mainly from states. I mean, there's also, of course, political alignment and political non-alignment. So anybody who resists is usually from a party that's not represented at the center, right? So is it right. all down to just uh, the way our politics is run? They don't necessarily have a lot of power to resist this. I mean, if the central government passes a legislation in parliament, there's not very much that the state government can do. Uh, not just legislation, but also rules. I mean, there's a lot of uh, de facto legislation going on now in New Delhi by uh, changing rules. So again, I've seen that in the Employment Guarantee Act, how ch changes are made in the rules by somebody sitting in New Delhi. Uh, rules that actually should be scrutinized by parliament, uh, but they are not. And uh, that becomes something that the states don't really have any power to challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, we, with the GST, I mean, the G GST has taken a lot of power from the states. Right. But that did exist for a long time. I mean, there were negotiations for many years. Uh, but uh, now that the system is in place, uh, they are finding themselves bereft of a lot of... Uh, taxation powers and discovering the consequences. Right, right. So there's, it's, it's also been a major resource crunch, right, uh, at That's the state right. level. Right? Mm. Yeah. So I have another question from our audience who's saying, how can we now fruitfully add more cooperation in our economy? Do you have any thoughts on, on this? I think that's what we all need to think about. But one place to start, I think, is the schooling system. I mean, the schooling system in India is a hotbed of competition. Uh, you know, the, it's a kind of obstacle course where the system is trying to pick the best. 
and the other ones are left behind and more or less abandoned. Uh, so I think, and, and, and there's very little uh, fostering of cooperation in the schooling system. So I think that these are, these are values and practices that should be imparted from childhood. So the schooling system would be one thing to think about. I think the present system is really unfair and it's designed for the winners. I mean, if you look at if you if you if you look at a textbook, if you look at a class ten math text textbook today, you know it's completely beyond, uh, completely inappropriate for first generation learners from the disadvantaged communities and so on. It's quite fine for a you know privileged child who has a good learning environment at home and good you know uh, well educated parents who can pay for tuitions and all that is fine because they will learn, they will they will complete class ten at a high level of learning, but it's quite inappropriate for a large majority of underprivileged children. So I think the way the system is designed for the winners uh, really needs to be rethink, rethought. In the last few months, we have seen another dramatic example of how education policy is driven by the interests of the privileged. I mean, the, the schools have been closed for 17 months now, and they're probably going to be closed for another few weeks at the very least in many states. Uh, the consequences for poor children have been absolutely devastating. But uh, the uh, government managed to create an impression that the damage was being uh, contained through online learning. Online learning is fine for a small minority of privileged children. And the parents of these children are resisting the opening of schools because their children are safe at home. They continue studying through online education and they would rather let that continue than to expose their children to infection risk by re reopening the schools. But the vast majority of parents in India today want, desperately want the schools to reopen because their children have been deprived of any education now for so long. You know, it's not just that online education is a fiction, but also the private tuition centers have been closed. Many parents in any case don't have money for tuition. And the, many of these children are not able to study on their own without help. I mean, especially the ones in the uh, primary classes uh, and especially the ones who have not yet, yet learned to read and write properly. So those children uh, are now in a situation where not only had they not learned a lot in terms of the curriculum uh, before the lockdown started, but on top of that now they've forgotten uh, a lot of what they had learned. And on top of that, they have been promoted two classes ahead. So they are all set now to be unable to uh, catch up and to be de facto dropouts. Now, the striking thing, this is one part of the story, but the more striking part is that there has been virtually no discussion of this until very re recently, until this month actually. Uh, except, of course, in specialized circles among educationists and a few people who were following the situation. But otherwise, I have not seen any serious public debate about the situation until this month. And so these, uh, this, this, this vast majority of underprivileged children have been inv invisibilized. So I think the education system, coming back to your question, is a good place to start. And we need to try to rethink it, make it, make it less competitive and use the schooling system as a, a forum where cooperative values and uh, habits can be imparted. Right, right, absolutely. I think that's a very valid point. I think if I have to play off uh, the de play the devil's advocate, at some level, people would say that uh, we recognize inequities in our educational system by providing for reservation, right? And that fact that it's been here for so long uh, so what would you do about it? I mean, that's an argument one hears a lot uh, when you talk about uh, inequities in the education system and how that's done away with. But of course, uh, I, I'm, I'm just simply playing the devil's advocate here. I think, I think we have to come to terms with the fact that the education system in India is one of the most unequal in the world. I mean, we are so used to these inequalities that we don't notice how pathological they are. Uh, according to UNESCO, uh, close to 90% of children in the world are studying in government schools. And many of those who are in private schools study in uh, private nonprofit schools. So the, pr the proportion of children who are studying in commercial 
private schools is uh, very small, below 10%. In India, it's for about 40% and growing. And on top of that, there are multiple layers within the private system and within the government system uh, with all kinds of differences in access and quality depending on class and class and ability to pay and so on and so forth. So we have a completely stratified education system that ends up reproducing instead of addressing the economic and social inequalities that are plaguing uh, Indian society. So I think I don't think we can deny that there is a serious problem here. You've talked about the school curriculum and you've talked about, I mean, inequities there. How can we think of ways in which to build in cooperation in economic theory? Can economic theory now really think of a broader notion of self-interest than the narrow sort of rationality that is generally harped upon? Yes, I mean, there are economists who have been <laughs> working and writing about these things. Uh, for example, it's interesting. I mean, let's take the example of game theory since you mentioned game theory earlier. Um, <clears throat> game theory was basically born and nurtured for a long time uh, as part of the military establishment. I mean, the idea was the, the hope rather was to be able to design uh, some, some effective strategies that would uh, help uh, in military activities. And uh, so the, the search was for some rational way of taking decisions in strategic situations where the decisions of different actors are interdependent. Now, many decades later, uh, one of the lessons of game theory is that actually in many situations, even very simple strategic situations, there is no obvious way to take a rational decision. This is not the way game theory is normally taught, but there are game theorists who have written extensively about this. And I would even say some of the best game theorists. Uh, one of them, for example, is Anatol Rappaport, who is another example of a forgotten thinker, uh, somebody who had really, I think, a lot of brilliant ideas not just in game theory, but in many other fields, because he was also a biologist, um, systems theorist, a psychologist, uh, and also, by the way, a great musician. But anyway, so he was one of the great minds of the 20th century, but very few people remember him today. I'll be surprised if any of the people who are listening to us today uh, remember him. So there are people like that who have developed an extensive body of uh, scholarly writing that could be built on to look at a field like game theory. Uh, in quite a different way. Uh, what he felt was the, that the big lesson of game theory, or, or rather more precisely of non cooperative game theory, game theory, is that because in many strategic situations, there is no obviously rational way to play, uh, what becomes very important uh, in real life uh, is uh, uh, ethics, uh, habits of thought, uh, solidarity, cooperation, uh, uh, all kinds of things that are not necessarily determined by rational thinking, but they are not irrational. They basically belong to emotions for that matter. They are not, it is not rational thinking, but it's uh, not irrational either. It's the realm of non-rational uh, thinking and behavior. So there are a lot of interesting ideas that one could use to try to uh, study something like the game theory in a different manner. But again, we have to, you know, we have to <laughs> deal with the fact that the incentive for a game theorist today is not to do that at all. The incentive is to publish more and more technical papers to get published in top journals that follow a certain framework and then make a good career. Right. Which kind of, I think, a reader has also posited this question and I also have it. So it's, I think in some ways this, uh, emphasis on rationality and self-interest and competition is also because economists seem to have a very large, great access to politicians, to policymakers, and much more in the recent times where you're talking about evidence-based policies and you're talking about rigor and you're bringing data and numbers. So why aren't some other domains or disciplines like sociology uh, which might traditionally 
uh, or philosophy, which might emphasize some of the points that you just said, cooperation and ethics, why aren't they able to make greater inroads into the realm of policymaking? I mean, why do economists sort of seem to have a, a dominant position in this field? So you're asking why economists have so much influence on policy making? Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Well, I don't know. Uh, maybe because, you know, I mean, economic matters have a lot of influence. I mean, when, when economic interests are involved, uh, the stakes are high. And I suppose that economists are thought of as people who, who can help with economic matters. It's not always obvious that they, that they do. I mean, we don't learn much about the economy in economics. We learn about economic models, which is not the same thing at all. Um, <clears throat> there was an interesting uh, survey recently reported by George Akerlof in one of his papers where economists were asked what is important, what they feel is important for their career. And so, this, so there were various options like, you know, proficiency in mathematics and uh, reading uh, professional journals and so on. And of course, proficiency in mathematics, I think was the top or around the top. And then one of them was um, understanding the economy and that was like the lowest. <laughs> so, uh, I, I mean, I'm only partly joking. I think that it's one thing to, I mean, I, I had done a PhD in economics, but I only learned all kinds of mathematical models that have a very uh, partial relation to what's actually going on. And so economists not, don't necessarily understand a lot about how real world economy functions. If you look at recent debates, you know, about uh, let's say the farm laws or the uh, uh, allowing uh, foreign direct investment in retail, all kinds of things. It's not, all, I mean, economists are not always making uh, impressive contributions to these debates. I think they should really be much more. In that respect, I agree with, Dr. Kurian, that they are missing in action. But anyway, so coming back to your question, um, I, th I think rightly or wrongly, <clears throat> I think economists are thought to be able to provide advice on things for which there are high stakes, uh, like obviously the economy. I mean, there's still a lot of obsession, as you know, in public policy with uh, increasing the growth rate. I mean, it's almost like uh, seen as the only thing that really matters. So obviously, if you're obsessed with increasing the growth rate, then obviously you would want you would go to uh, economists for advice. Um, and I suppose perhaps uh, social scientists in other disciplines are not considered so important also because in a similar manner uh, and for similar reasons perhaps, their own discipline does not always equip them very well uh, to understand society and politics. I mean, if you look at social media today, you, you find that there are all kinds of people who have very interesting ideas on what's going on in society and politics. And it's not always obvious why we would need a political scientist to enlighten us. So anyway, these are some of the possible reasons. <clears throat> Certainly, I think economists, I think, have some sort of a stronghold because they also bring in numbers, right? And that's always yeah. held up. That's a good, good that's answer. Thank you. Golden rule. <laughs> you should have answered the question. <laughs> No, but I think I also increasingly worry. I open a sociology journal or I open a political science journal now, and they're very close clones of econ economics journal uh, because they are trying to do the same kinds of methods. In fact, it's an insider's joke in the economics profession that if you can't get it published in a top econ journal, try a top sociology journal because they're a few years behind in terms of thinking about the empirics, the econometrics, so to speak. So I think um, it, it seems like a race to the bottom, not a race to the top. I think the mathematicians feel the same about economists that they are decaying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when I was studying at the Indian Statistical Institute uh, in the 1980s, uh, there, were, there, was a there was a mathematics department and the economics department, and the mathematicians had a lot of <laughs> contempt for economists. In fact, uh, one of my best math teachers, K.R. Patasarati, when he tried to refer to a bad way of doing things, he used to say, this is an economist way of doing things, but anyway. I would agree. But you talked about uh, growth and that's why people go to economists to try and learn about how to grow the economy, etc. But I am combining this with a question that's come in is that given the way that we are in and you alluded to this in your talk about climate change and the greater need for cooperation. So in this sort of 
I think enlightened world, we should be talking to people, climate change experts, right? So there should be greater cooperation amongst disciplines. Right? It's, it's not possible now to talk about economic growth uh, and development and not worry about sustainability. So doesn't that automatically help us think more about cooperation and the value of working together? I think you are right. I think that's a good point. But uh, as you as you also mentioned earlier, there's a bit of a hierarchy in disciplines, and uh, economists maybe have too too much say. Um, one problem with the fact that economists think much more about competition than cooperation is that it tends to be a self fulfilling way of looking at things. I mean, if you think about economic policy uh, based on models that are all about incentives and competition and markets and so on, and where a lot of other, th other things are missing, including the value of cooperation, then you tend to end up making recommendations that push things further in that direction. So I think I would agree with you that, uh, uh, you know, the economists have to, they have, they have a role, obviously, I'm not, I'm not at all disparaging either economists or economics. I think both have a role, but as you say, they have to be part of a larger uh, process of public deliberation, and not just for climate change. I would say for most public policies, including economic policy, uh, the way we should think of ourselves is as being contributing to a larger deliberation process. I think this is very important because there's a tendency in economics to think that an expert will come up with some recommendation. Uh, you know, many economics papers end with a section called uh, policy implications. And by the way, very often the policy implications don't follow from the analysis that, that was presented earlier. But then, anyway, leaving that aside. So the idea is that you, you analyze a problem and then you make a policy recommendation. And then hopefully through some process that's not really, really very well specified, it will have an impact on public policy. Uh, I, I think that is actually quite dangerous because I think uh, advice from a single expert very often tends to be wrong. And uh, we, for all important policy matters, we do need a process of deliberation. I'm saying that partly in reaction to the current uh, fashion of so-called evidence-based policy, where the idea is that you just perform a kind of experiment, you find out, quote unquote, what works. And then if you find that something works, then it implies that it's worth doing. I think that's, a, that's a, quite a misleading way of thinking about public policy. I think evidence, of course, is important, not just randomized trials, but evidence as a whole, which is much more than randomized controlled trials. Uh, but evidence is only a very small part of the process. We need evidence, we need understanding, which is not the same as evidence. We need values because we, not, you know, we cannot take, uh, make policy prescriptions without values. And we need deliberation. I think all these things are important. And if we try to drive policy based only on evidence, I think there's a risk of uh, wrong decisions. Thank you all uh, very much, extremely for bearing with us. I think this was actually a very interesting session and I was enjoying the conversation enormously. We are very lucky to have had this opportunity to hear some of uh, Jean's thoughts and comments.